the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this fourth day of September, we have many, many saints. This is one of the wonderful things about the Synaxara. There, there's endless saints to read about and to learn and to take inspiration from. Today, there's so many saints. Unfortunately, we can't talk about all of them, so we're just going to commemorate a few, and then we'll get right into the life that we're going to talk about. The main ancient saints are the Hierarch of Babylos, Bishop of Antioch and the three uh, children with him, Hier the Holy Martyr of Babylos, the teacher of Nicomedia, and the 84 children with him. We have the great prophet, Mo uh, um, prophet Moses. There's an icon of Prophet Moses. We talked about him last year, so we're not going to talk about him this year. Uh, each year we'll try to talk about a different saint on the, on the feast day. Uh, we also have uh, St. Anthemus the Blind, who is from Catalonia? He's a relatively new saint, a great missionary, even though he was blind and he did a lot of missionary work. So when people say, oh, I have this problem, I'm blind, I'm this, I'm that, we have examples in the lives of the saints that even though they're blind, they do amazing works. They, they become men of God and they lead many people to salvation. So we, we never should give up. We also have Saint Hermione, one of the four daughters of the Apostle Philip, who was a... Uh, uh, quite a charismatic uh, and grace-filled uh, 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 prophetess in the ancient church. And many other martyrs, too many to commemorate today. We're going to go right to the, to the saint of the day, and we've chosen someone, a modern saint, somebody close to us. Uh, let's get to the timeline. So, where is the... Here we go. The new higher martyr... Gorazd, Gorazd, Bishop of Slovakia and the Czech lands. And he is from the 20th century. Here's an icon of him showing the place of his, uh, connected with his martyrdom. We'll talk about that. This is a Nazi. He was actually killed by the Nazis. Does everybody know what the Nazis are? The Nazis were yes. a political party that took over Germany and they brought about uh, and provoked the Second World War and they were, they were quite ruthless and he was killed martyred by them. We'll have questions at the end. Keep your questions. And here are the two other, the three other martyrs with him. We're going to talk about uh, the, the whole witness that they gave there at the time uh, of the uh, beginning of the Second World War. Uh, so let's look at where we at in, ti in time. We're in the 20th century. He was born in 1879, so we're down here at the end of our timeline, and he was martyred in 1942. So just about 70 years ago or less, less than 70 years ago, 68, 9, nine years ago, and uh, right here close to us. And so it's, it's always good to run to those saints close to us because there is a, 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 a river of tradition, a holy uh, tradition that comes down to us, and those saints close to us are given by God and are inspiring for us in our day. And so that's why we're looking at this saint today, especially. Uh, we're going to... We're going to look at his life here. Here we go. Uh, get out of here. Uh, and we'll get down in a minute. So our, uh, our new martyr was born in Moravia. Let's look at our, let's go to our Google map here. And fly over to Moravia and see where, where is that? It's an ancient, actually one, the places that were missionized, the place that was missionized by the great missionaries to the Slavs. This was where they originally were sent. And this is in modern-day Czechoslovakia. This is Moravia. It's a part of the state of Czechoslovakia. And if we go out a little bit, we'll see the big city of Prague, not far from here, eventually. Well, in any case. Slovakia and Moravia and Czechoslovakia. This is where we are in the middle of Eastern Europe. Uh, a little bit tweaked, so let's go. There we go, that makes more sense. So you remember, of course, we talked a lot about Greece, we talked about the Middle, the middle East and Jerusalem, you, you remember that, and here's, yeah, yeah, in Constantinople, we've talked a lot about that. Now, there is uh, Czechia and Moravia, and that's where the great missionary, St. Cyril and Donish, was sent thousand years ago. Well, our saint did not grow up in the Orthodox Church. 
So, like many of us, he was a convert to the faith as an adult. In fact, he had become a Roman Catholic priest. We, we refer to the Roman Catholics in that way, although the, the term Roman Catholic is really not uh, accurate when talking about the heretical uh, synagogue of the Latins or the Franks. Uh, but he grew up in this confession, and he uh, became interested in the origins became interested in the origins of his faith, because he knew it, that, that the faith came from Constantinople, came from the East, and was brought to his land. And he started to investigate. And he wanted to know more about the saints that had brought the Orthodox faith to his land, Constantine and Methodius, uh, uh, Cyril and Methodius. And among the, he became one of the leaders of reform in the uh, Roman Catholic communion there in Moravia. And when the state of Czechoslovakia was established after the First World War, so in 1919, about 23 years before his martyrdom, there was this new place established called Czechoslovakia. And he was one, at that time in 1919, right after the First World War, he was one of the delegation that was sent to Rome to, the, to, to obtain from the Pope of Rome he was a, a part of this confession. He had to obtain autonomy to be self-governed, not to have the Pope over them, but also to have the Czech language, to be able to speak their own language in the services, because it was all in Latin, and they wanted to speak it in their language. They remembered, for sure, that the saints had come and had preached and taught in the, and created the Slavic language. And so they were thinking, why do we have to speak Latin? This was the Roman Catholic vision of things. And they wanted to do what the saints who had come to their land had done, and that is speak it in the language of the people. You want to ask a question quickly? Yeah. So the Pope is the head of this confession called Catholicism. All right? And he, he, he's in charge of that. So when he was still a part of that, before he became Orthodox, he was seeking from that leader to change uh, things and make it more like the saints had, had preached and taught a thousand years before. The Pope did not listen. That's what I'm about to say. The Pope said, no, I don't think so. Turned down your proposal. And so slowly about 800,000, it says here, 800,000 Christians, there's a lot of people who wanted to see these changes in Moravia and in Czechoslovakia, 800,000 people said, we uh, uh, want to pray in our own language. We want to be a, a continuers of the tradition preached by the saints, St. Cyril Methodius. And so they went to the Orthodox Patriarch of Serbia next door. Let's go to our map, and we can see, uh, we go in here, down here is Serbia, and not far, one of the closest Orthodox churches to the Moravian uh, area, to Czechoslovakia, was Serbia. And they went down here to Serbia, and they said to the Patriarch there, the Orthodox Patriarch, uh, well, um, would you accept us into the Orthodox Church? He said, of course. And he'd already been doing missionary work among the Carpathal Russians. Uh, if you go back to the map, you'll see uh, that uh, not far from here, in southern Poland and Slovakia and Ukraine, there's a, lot, there's a whole group of people called Carpathal Russians, and many of them at this time were becoming Orthodox. Many were becoming Orthodox, and he wanted to be a part of this whole movement. And so, and they were already doing missionary work among them, both the Russian church and the Serbian church. So, not long after that, we'll go down a little bit to the text here on the internet because I have you know, noted some things here that, let's see, here, and point out some things here. Um, so, he, he was received into the Orthodox church. Uh, he was joined by tens of thousands, I'm not sure if it was 800,000, but initially that, that was the number. Some of them turned back. And he was made a bishop at the age of 42, after a year of being in the Orthodox Church. And uh, one of the people that had made him a bishop was the famous holy uh, metropolitan of Kiev, Anthony Krapovitsky. And he is a very well-known and holy man of the 20th century, he was actually one of the main support, uh, founders of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. He was among those doing missionary work among the Carpathian Russians. And the bishop who brought him in also became a saint. So these are very holy people of the 20th century who are, who are being connected with our saints that we're commemorating today. 
Uh, he was uh, also a part of, in 1934, he took part as bishop now in commemorating uh, many of the martyrs that had, had been, there have been 94 Orthodox who had been martyred, who had been killed for their faith because they, were, they, they had renounced uh, Catholicism and Uniatism, which, is, which, which was the uh, group of people that were there and, and following the Pope. They had become Orthodox and they were actually put on trial for that and they were killed. They were many martyrs in this area for the sake of the faith. And he was one of those commemorating. So he had really embraced with all his heart the Orthodox faith and become himself a teacher and confessor. He had gone, he went around uh, his, his diocese, started 11 parishes. And here, listen to what he was doing to bring the Orthodox faith to uh, the people in his area. He was translating services into the language of the people. Very important. This is always what the missionaries do. Wherever they go, Orthodox missionaries, one of the first things they do, Papa Kosmas, who went down to Africa, or the missionaries to Alaska, or anywhere that Orthodox missionaries go, what is the first thing they do? They translate the services from the language that the missionaries are coming from, whether it be Greek or Russian, Slavonic, into the local language. And this is what he did. And he published a prayer book, and he published a book of needs, a, a service book for priests. He published a catechism and other many works in the Czech language. So he was uh, translating and publishing. Very important work. This is the same thing that's been going on in America for the last hundred or two hundred years. Much work has been done to bring the faith into the language that people can understand. Now, he was criticized. He was accused falsely by both Orthodox, who turned back to Catholicism, and by many of the Roman Catholic and Union priests. He was uh, put through many trials and tribulations. And he was, there were people who didn't, didn't want that. They didn't want to go through all that, and they turned back. It was too burdensome, they said, to be Orthodox. So he actually lost a lot of people and went back to Catholicism. And if you remember in the Gospel yesterday at the, at the Divine Liturgy, you remember he, the Lord said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. In fact, if you are truly picking up your cross and living in Christ, it's not burdensome. Even if you're put through trials and tribulations and accusations and all kinds of things, you're still, uh, your burden does not seem light because God lightens it for you. So these people had, unfortunately, not entered in to the whole uh, life of the church, and so they, had, they turned back out of weakness and human uh, weakness and temptation. But he went on, he became a great missionary to his people, uh, starting many parishes, and then, uh, not long after that, after about being a priest and, a, and then a bishop for about 20 years, the Nazis from Germany came down and entered into Czechoslovakia and took over in 1938. Now, the ruler that they placed over the Czechoslovakian people was a very cruel and harsh man and had been persecuting and killing many people and ruling over the Czech people with a very uh, harsh rule. And there were resistance fighters who had fled, who came back and assassinated, had killed the, the leader of the Nazis. And they took refuge in the cathedral of, the, of our bishop today. They went to the basement of the, of the cathedral. Some, some people there, uh, priests and others, had said, take refuge here. And that was planned. They went there. They took refuge. And they were hiding there for weeks and weeks, and the Nazis were searching for them. Eventually, somebody betrayed uh, the uh, Czech uh, people, uh, the, the, the resistance fighters, and uh, they, were, they were found out, and the Nazis came and bombarded and eventually killed these uh, resistance fighters. Well, the bishop knew immediately this was going to be a huge problem for the Orthodox Church in Moravia, in Czechoslovakia. They were going to take measures against the Orthodox Church, and they took they took immediately into custody the two priests and the lay people of the of the cathedral. Well, the saint wrote immediately a letter to the Nazis saying, "I am to blame. Do not harm my priests. I am to blame, and let them go and take me instead." And that's what they did. They put him into prison, and not long after. He was tortured, and he was shot, and he was martyred for the sake of the Orthodox faith, for the sake of his own flock. He gave his life up for the flock, 
And what does our Lord say in the gospel? There's no greater love than this, than to lay down your life for the brethren. There's no greater love. When we do that, we are like Christ. We follow after him and give our whole life for the sake of the love of Christ and the brethren. This is what our saint did today. So not only did he deny his, his uh, upbringing and embrace the faith and suffer persecution for that, but he denied his own life. He denied his own uh, well-being and gave himself up for the sake of his fellow uh, brethren. Unfortunately, that did not stop the cruelty of the Nazis. And we, we see that they continued to persecute the Orthodox Church brutally. They killed 550 more people. They wiped out villages. They put people into labor camps. They sent priests into exile. And truly, the Orthodox Church in Czechoslovakia was almost decimated because of this persecution. But it's been, it's been revived in our day. And it's, it's got a whole hierarchy and local church and a life there that's thriving. And this, our saint was recognized as an Orthodox uh, uh, saint uh, by the Orthodox Church of, S of Serbia as a new martyr. Uh, in 1961, and he was glorified in the cathedral, where he uh, uh, named after him in Moravia in 1987. Uh, so uh, this is, in very quickly and in, in, in brief, the major strokes of, uh, uh, the major themes of the life of our saint today. He was a confessor, he was a missionary, he was a martyr, and he gave himself up to the life of his flock. What a great example in the 20th century for us. Uh, there's so much here that we can take from and learn from. What's so, it's so important that we understand our faith, we know our faith, and we confess our faith. And that in this confession is holiness. We find holiness, we find like, likeness with Christ when we do that. When we're not fearful of the world, we become like Christ. When we're prepared to give our own comforts and ease will become like Christ. When we even give our own life, then we become like Christ. This is a path to be like Christ, which is the whole point of our life. So this is a great example. Let's look at what we can take from our saint today. And you, you have some questions here. We'll start with Maria here. Uh-huh. Maria? Oh, so the cathedral is the main church where the bishop is, and parishes are the little churches where the in the communities and the in the towns and cities where the priests are. So, like our little church here is a parish where you come uh, for, for Sunday liturgy, but there's also the cathedral where the bishop is. So that's where he was, and that's where he was, uh, the people were hiding, and eventually he was, uh, no, parish. Yeah, that's a, that's a, go ahead. Yeah, so that was an image showing that the, that the Nazi ruler was like a snake. He was doing the will of the enemy of the devil, right? Here's an image of the, of the cathedral where, where, the, where the, they were hiding out from the Nazis and where they eventually... Here is a monument to those soldiers. They, had, they built a monument there to commemorate them. It's a, it's a great place of pilgrimage, so to speak, for all the people in Czech, Czechoslovakia, and 60,000 people, they say, go there every year and... and venerate the, the memory of these soldiers, which were hidden by the Orthodox in Go ahead, India. Uh, why does the Apostle have a man face? That's the first one. So it's in a symbol or something. It's a symbol. Oh, he is. He is a fatal drop. Yeah, because that was, that was the Nazi head who was persecuting the church there. He did a little kefalist to the Nazi stone. Uh, here also is something you might be interested in. I don't know for all of you, but the parents can decide. There's a movie been made about these soldiers and these resistance fighters, and I'm sure they mentioned the bishop in there as well. So we also have a saint, I don't know if you know this, that's been re recently glorified in Germany, Orthodox young man who was killed by the Nazis for resisting uh, and... and uh, He's been glorified by the Russian church. So we do have a few, a few of our saints actually were persecuted by the Nazis. And, and uh, it's a big part of the 20th century history. So this is a, a look for you into uh, recent history, recent church history. Uh, you can see that there were people who were given their life against this terrible 
plague that had reached uh, Europe at the time, and one of them is the saint we're celebrating today. To the prayers of our Holy Father, God, may 